Y'all, that joke. Y'all, I can't tell you. Let me explain something to you. When my eyes is getting bad, man, and I'm up in there, and it won't stop because uh, the people keep talking, and, and, and I keep trying. Every time I try to catch your name, it keep popping like three. And I'm, I'm, like, I'm sorry about that. How you doing, my brother? Doing well, man. It's great to be with you. Man, let me tell you something, man. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. And I've been watching you. And uh, just like I know how much you love hip-hop, you know, I love politics. And I love a man that stands up for the people. Um, Eric Garner, Big George Floyd, yelled out the same words, I can't breathe. What? It's deep. It's deep. You know, we have a systematic problem here in America that goes back to the founding of the republic, right? That's the bottom line. The country uh, was founded under great high ideals, liberty and justice for all you know, all men are created equally. We hold these truths to be self-evident, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But at the same time, there was a, a birth defect, a genetic imperfection in America on the question of race. And it manifested itself, of course, initially around chattel slavery, one of the worst crimes in the history of the world. And America has constantly tried to perfect itself Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, we've come a long way, uh, but we still have a long way to go as the police violence continues to demonstrate. Because fundamentally, racism is in the soil of the country from the founding moment to this very day, and it's been hard to shake. When I think about you, you grew up in Brooklyn. Um, I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, I remember all those assemblies when we singing, we shall overcome. You learned everything about white American history. What made you want to go to the House of Representatives? What made you, from Brooklyn, a hip hop fan, go to the House of Representatives? And let's be honest, most of the guys in there are older white men. How did you feel you could be effective and you could make change or you could trust these people and you could honestly do you do could, do you honestly look at your peers and believe that they're trying to believe what you're telling them about your community you know i think that the majority of people here on both sides of the aisle are trying to do the right thing from their perspective but their life experiences are different than the life experience that you had growing up in the bronx or that I may have had growing up in Brooklyn, or that people in South Central Los Angeles, the South Side of Chicago, uh, or you know other parts of the country where people grow up under very different circumstances and so their life experiences are different. Uh, my view was, it's interesting, I was in college at Binghamton University in my senior year and I turned on the TV and LA was in flames. This was in 1992. And LA was in flames because the four officers who had beat Rodney King on tape were all acquitted by an all-white jury in Simi Valley. And I said at that moment that I was going to go to law school and try to contribute to social, racial, and economic justice. And then after becoming a lawyer, a few years in, I decided that I wanted to try to use uh, the, the training that I received in the art and science of the law to advocate on behalf of some of the communities that I grew up in in central Brooklyn. And that's what led me down this path eventually to the House of Representatives. I seen the, uh, I saw the press conference you did around Eric Garner's time with, uh, Engel and Jose Serrano and everybody, and you said, what more do you have to see? What more does America have to see? Um, it's the same thing all over again, right? 
And it's a little bit scarier this time because I'm going to keep it real with you because these young kids are talking about they want an eye for an eye. They want violence out here, right? And if you're not hearing it, I'm sure you're hearing it. And, you know, we've been historical. You know, even Tupac took a shot at us in uh, California. We said, only in Cali will we riot, not rally. Like, you know, you know, because we're, we're, we're quick to go out there Al Sharpton, everybody, and protest with a sign, but not get nothing done, right? I'm looking at this man. It's a big difference from Eric Garner, even though same, same situation. They killed Eric Garner. But I think it went, uh, they couldn't handle him, and they wound up choking him, and he was big. And this man was in handcuffs. There was three other police officers there in broad daylight, and the man had his knee on his neck. He murdered this man. Like, not arrest gone bad, not we thought he had a gun. This was murder. And, and he could care less that he was murdering the man on TV. And I'm getting a little upset because... I'm, believe it or not, Fat Joe the Gangsta Rapper, I'm more of about peace. I come from a time where love uh, overcomes everything. M Malcolm X, uh, uh, Martin Luther King. You know, Mal Malcolm X was talking it, but Martin Luther King was preaching love and bringing people together. But now I say to myself, all right, so you're watching that and you're recording that. At what point do you put the camera down and you punch the cop in his face when you know he's killing the black brother right there in front of you. At what point is, is that supposed to happen? Yeah, it's a rough, it's a rough thing because, you know, as lawyers, we tell young people that when you're on the streets, uh, the police have home field advantage at that point. Every time. Every time. I don't argue with now, the cops, by the way. Right. I, would, I won't argue with them. Don't argue with the cops. It may just further escalate the situation. But in this particular instance, you did have a police officer uh, who was, was exhibiting what we would call in the law depraved indifference to human life and was not paying attention to anything that was going on. The pleas, as it relates to I can't breathe, what the folks were saying around them, and so it's a troubling thing. Here on the Hill, we've been saying for a long period of time that we got to get this situation right between the police and the community before things escalate out of control. That's just real talk. And we've been saying it to my Republican colleagues and others. Yeah, but Hakeem, I think, I think and, and I don't want to put you in a bad position, right? Because I'm definitely not trying to jam you up. But I think there's, there's, there's some white people out there that are ready and are pushing us to have a race war in America. Not just Obama talking, not just, I'm not talking, I'm talking about there's an actual element out there that's testing everybody's patience to try to provoke a race war. Do you agree with this, what I'm telling you? I think that you're on to something in the context of the fact that we are in what I call the third backlash moment in American history. Every time we've made progress in America, it's provoked the backlash. So we were able to, to get emancipation done. And then you have what's called the Reconstruction Era the 13th Amendment outlaws slavery, 14th Amendment equal protection under the law, 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote regardless of race. This all took place in the 1860s through 1878. Then the North pulls out of the South. And all of a sudden, after 13 years of Reconstruction progress, you had the rise of Jim Crow, the rise of the KKK, Supreme Court decides Plessy versus Ferguson, essentially uh, saying separate and unequal is constitutional. 
you had a lynching epidemic emerge. The black codes were imposed. And this lasted about 100 years until the next generation, you referenced them, rose up, Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, to try to move America forward. Again, second moment of progress. And then you had the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, Medicare, Medicaid, War on Poverty. It all ended in 68 with the Fair Housing Act. And then what happens again? Progress followed by backlash. Who gets elected? Richard Nixon. Running on a platform of so-called law and order, capitalizing on the anxiety that some people in America had on the progress that had just been made with the civil rights movement. And then that brings in anti-busing, anti-government, anti-affirmative action. And then you have a new hope arise in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. And you remember, Joe, people were saying, this is a post-racial America. How long did that last? Because the historians understand I'm saying the historians at that moment right there, a historian, when Barack Obama was, was elected, the historians said, oh, there's some shit coming in eight years. They, 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 they knew something. They, they knew the backlash was coming, right? If you're telling me anytime progress it, or change in a big way like that, you always have to ex expect the backlash. That's right. Um, you got two young, young black males, two black sons. Are you ever in fear when they go outside the house or they leave the house that something might go wrong out there? Yeah, it's real. I mean, that's a real concern. And in fact, recently they're teenage boys right now and they'll come to me and say, dad, did you see this video? Right? They, they're the ones that brought me the Ahmed Aubrey video. And it's a hard thing because you know that at any moment in time, you know, they can get jammed up in a bad situation simply because of who they are, where they're at, the clothing that they're wearing. And so we've got to put an end to this and we got to do it with the fierce urgency of now. The Congressional let me, Black Pro Yeah. Let me ask you a question. What do you think we can actually do? It seems like when these offices, we give up enough outrage like in Rodney King, if they even indict it, because they don't even indict these guys, but even indict it, somehow they beat the charges and they walk away easier and there's even more tension. How can we, do you see an end in sight? How can we, could you educate us on how we can make this better? How can we activate in a positive way? Because I really don't like to hear what I'm hearing from my young brothers and sisters, you know, because everybody's yelling for an eye for an eye. They're tired of this, right? And we know we're not going to win against the cops and the army, you know? So is there, uh, is there a, a light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to involve a variety of different things. One, we have to continue to diversify the force. When you and I were coming up, you know, in the early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, into the early 90s, the overwhelming majority of the force, keeping it real, were Irish American or Italian American. Absolutely. Not black, not Latino, not Asian. Now we've seen a shift in that, and at least there's some cultural fluency uh, and familiarity with the community. It doesn't mean that black cops or Latino cops don't cross the line because they do. But it, it is part of the solution, cultural fluency, awareness, respect. The other thing that I say quickly, Joe, is that probably the most important thing is accountability. Because if when an officer crosses the line, as clearly happened in Minneapolis, and there are no consequences because the DA says, I'm not going to indict. Or if the DA indicts the judge or the jury, lets them off. 
then they're unleashed to continue the behavior because there are no consequences. And so we got yes, to figure out a better way of making sure there's accountability. I know you have Instagram, and if you don't have it, your kids do. Um, we were watching, and, and listen, some of my best friends, I swear to God, I'm not using it as a cliche. Some of my brothers, the people I love the most on earth, my family are white people. Like, I'm being honest with you, some of, some of my best friends on earth are white people. I'm not talking from a racist perspective. But here in New York City, you got white people when they're supposed to social distance or stay home, catching suntans on the lawn in the West Village. Then you got police officers who are predominantly Latino and Black acting like a posse, just running on the hoods, beating everybody up in front of their buildings. Like, and so that tells me it makes me feel, and people in the hood feel like police officers are nothing more than a gang with, with powers over anybody and they can't get in trouble. And they can do it, they, they can act with aggressiveness. They could be wrong. The man was wrong who stepped on his, on his neck for seven whole minutes. He was wrong. We looked at him as a superiority, you know, protect us. And I'm not saying, I have friends that are police officers who are beautiful people. I'm not saying they all like that. But this police mentality of a blue coat of silence, everybody stay quiet like this. Because that was a coat of silence. The three other police officers were standing there while this guy was choking them out. And they did nothing about it. Couldn't nobody tap him and be like, yo, you're doing too much, my man. So um, who's going to police the police and really police the police? Because I've met with the police commissioner in, in New York to talk about what's going on in our communities. And with a straight face, he made me feel good when I left the uh, town hall. Shout out to Lisa Evans and Street Soldiers. And I thought change was coming. It was quiet for a little bit. But when I see these different video clips of these police officers just coming punching other people in the face. And if you look, I don't even want to go there. Like, I mean, you know, they men like we men. You understand what I'm saying? What makes them stronger or tougher than we are? You know, yeah. and, and so something really has to be done because this, I'm telling you, if you want to use Fat Joe as the ear to your street, this is getting bad. This is getting bad, and something has to be done. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. You know, in my experience in the community, you know, and I represent Bedford-Stuyvesant, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, East New York, Coney Island, uh, a variety of different communities in Brooklyn, and a little bit of Queens. The majority of police officers that I interact with are there to protect and serve. But you do have bad apples. And when things go wrong with those bad apples, there are tragic consequences. Now, you hit on one point about the blue wall of silence. That's a problem. Because if the majority of officers are good officers, but you have a, a code of silence that doesn't result in accountability for the bad ones, then you got a broken system. And then the last piece that I'd say we need to think about is that we have to change the mindset of law enforcement from a warrior mentality, mm. which leads to police violence, mm. to a guardian mentality, mm. which leads to a stronger relationship between the police and the community where you're there to protect and serve. Listen, Hakeem, I'm tough. I consider myself to be one of the toughest guys on earth, to be honest with you. But I don't have to talk to you in a tough way. I don't have to poke my chest and act tough. I could be kind. I'm a father. I'm a friend. I'm a son. Like, I just never understood why a police officer has to come with the, with the force and, 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 and why they can't. If they talk to people, it would be resolved right then and there. Look, young brother, man, you out of line, man. You know, you should just walk it off or whatever the case. But they come like this. 
And so now we got that in us, in our blood, that we got to respond the same way. And things escalate on another level. Um, you, um, we going to keep on that, but you, I'm going to tell you something you did that was very courageous and you wouldn't know it, right? So for years I've been watching uh, actors uh, receive Oscars and so there's a famous moment when Rita Moran was up there at the Oscars and she says now, 30 years later, had 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 she had the, the courage, she would go up there and said stuff about the brown and black community, which when she won and, and, and countless black actors or athletes, they didn't use uh their celebrity or their time at that moment to represent uh social justice or talk about the people. And you, man, I loved you when you went down there and you put up the Biggie Smalls poster and you quoted, it was all a dream in the House of Representatives. Do you know those, those, those the, to me, who study hip hop, uh, I'm a hip hop historian and who also studies politics, that was, that, <laughs> That was big for hip hop when you went up in there. Man. Why did you choose that you had to do? And I'm with you. I'm, I'm glad you did it. But yeah. What? 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 What made you say I'm gonna do this in front of yeah. seventy yeah. and eighty year old white guys around here? And I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna rep Brooklyn and Biggie. And why? What made you do that? Yeah, it's it's a great question. So that was the twentieth anniversary of his tragic killing, right? March 9th, 2017. And I was really in my office and one of my boys from back home hit me with a text and said, put on Hot 97, they're rocking all the Biggie classics right now. So I'm in my office in the Capitol complex and I put Hot 97 on the internet and they just, you know, killing it with all the biggie joints. Get money, who shot you, this, that, and the other. Sky's the limit, right? And I'm just, I'm getting excited. And I said, you know what? I told my staff, I said, I'm going to go to the Florida House of Representatives and I'm going to acknowledge what Biggie Smalls meant to the music, the culture, and the country. And then one of my staff members said, you can't do that. And I said, you know what? Do me a favor. Check the congressional record. And I guarantee you that you will see tributes to Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Bruce Springsteen, and others. And come back to me with the congressional record showing that. And I said, if Springsteen can get a tribute, if Elvis can get a tribute, if Sinatra can get a tribute on the Florida House of Representatives, then Biggie Smalls is going to get a tribute as well. And I just went to the floor and did it. Man, that was beautiful because I could tell you, it's hard. It's hard for you to do that. And a lot of brothers had the opportunity to do that and never did that. And I know because I study politics a lot and, and, and it was great for you to do that. It was a monumental moment. And I applaud you for it, but a lot of people like to play safe. Man, and when you go up there and you represent for Biggie, I was like, wow. And then you become uh, the impeachment manager, right? And then you start off the first day of the trial. Shout out to Ruben Diaz, Bronx Borough President. He's on the check-in. That's our brother. You That's start our off the trial by saying, <laughs> if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> yeah, was that important that was, for you to? I didn't expect to, to do that. That was that was just that was another. That's what we call in the law a spontaneous utterance. I wasn't even planning to rock that, Joe. Here's what happened. I'm sitting. We 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 give we gave our opening statements, and I'm sitting at the House Manager impeachment table with Adam Schiff right next to me, and then. The president's attorney got up and he said, this is a frivolous case. This is a waste of time. Why are we here? 
And he kept going through that refrain and asking the rhetorical question, why are we here? So then we had a break and I was up next. And I told Adam Schiff, I said, Adam, he just gave us an opening to answer that question. Why are we here? We're here because the president corruptly abused his power by pressuring a foreign government to target an American citizen. We're here because he betrayed the Constitution. We're here because he's corrupted the integrity of our democracy. That's why we're here, Mr. Secular. And for whatever reason, maybe it was the spirit of the late great Christopher Wallace in heaven. And I said, you know what? If you don't know, now you know, and I just walked off the floor. That's cold, man. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it is what it is, man. I said that, but, I was like, yo! Hey, but you hey, know, Joe, you know, it, 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 the house, right? You know this, because you're a student of politics. That's why I appreciate you, you know, so much. I mean, you know, I'm a legendary artist, uh, hey, but a, a student, student of politics, and, and the house, as distinct from the Supreme Court, the Senate, and the presidency, the House is designed to be the institution closest to the people. Mm. That's why I love this institution, because we are the ones who are supposed to reflect the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, the culture, the fear, the anxiety. The founder said the passions of the people. And so all of us should bring what we, you know, what makes us who we are based on where we're from to the Capitol. That's part of what the framers envisioned. They probably never envisioned someone spitting Biggie Smalls lyrics on the floor during an impeachment trial. An impeachment but, they try. <laughs> but they envision authentic representation of where you're from. And that's what I just try to do. Did you honestly believe he, be he, 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 he should have got impeached? Yeah, no, without question. I mean, he crossed the line because he pressured a government to try to interfere in the 2020 election. So essentially, what he's saying is that I'm going to take away the most precious aspect of our democracy, which is self-government, one person, one vote. And I'm going to try to alter the playing field by jamming Joe Biden up wrongly and artificially so I can try to steal the 2020 election. That's crossing the line. That, 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 that goes against everything that the framers thought would be wrong with, a, with someone going into office, uh, not as a, as a president, but as a king or as a monarch. And that's how Trump was behaving. Now, something's going on now. My brother Pete Diddy started it. Well, he said the black vote ain't for free. And then I'm starting to see other guys uh, come up and say, yo, you know, what if all of this is legitimate, what they're asking. And, um, but right now we either got Biden or we got Trump. And so I'm definitely a little bit against what, 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 what I feel like if we don't come out, Blacks and Latinos and act like Obama's running for president. Because cause I, I waited online four hours in the sun in Miami, 90 degrees, you know, for Obama two times, right? And I wouldn't get off the line. I was like, nah, I'm voting, right? Yeah. And that's the type of dedication that we need in order to elect Joe Biden. We can't have our leaders, our celebrity leaders or whatever, because because unfortunately, if you give a black or Latino a way out for them not to stand on that line for four to six hours, they don't. Right? So what do you say to people who saying, yo, we need answers for our black vote. We need, we, what do you, who should we vote for in the eyes of yours? In the most honest the most honest way, could you tell, I just want you to talk directly to our people Yeah. right now. I know you represent all of America and all the people, but I just want you to say, why we sh should we honestly vote 
for Joe Biden over Donald Trump? Yeah, now, listen, I mean, I think the bottom line is who's in office matters. And Joe Biden, right, has his own record of accomplishment, and he's got some challenges that he's been speaking about as well, most specifically around the 1994 crime bill. But a lot of people made mistakes around the 1994 crime bill. The question is, what are you going to do about that mistake? And so we've been having conversations with Joe Biden to say, listen, we need transformative criminal justice reform that reverse engineers the damage that was done by the 1994 crime bill. He's all in. He understands. So these that. are deliberate conversations with Joe Biden. Joe Biden, we need this transparency. This is what we're looking for. And Joe Biden's saying, if I become president, I promise you, I'm going to make that happen. That's correct. I sat down leadership from Cedric Richmond, you know, shout out to New Orleans, Cedric Richmond, who's one of the co-chairs of the campaign. Bobby Scott, one of the leading voices in Congress on criminal justice reform, and myself, I think Karen Bass was there to chair the Congressional Black Caucus as well. This is before any of us had gotten involved in the presidential race at all. And he came to the Hill, and we had a conversation about our ideas around criminal justice reform and the need to do something transformative. I know some of my other colleagues have been talking to him about an empowerment agenda for the Black and Latino community. Because yes, we're still fighting these battles as you've been articulating around racial justice, social justice as well, but we've got to go beyond it to make sure that we are, I mean, you've been an incredibly successful entrepreneur. We want to make sure we open up entrepreneurial opportunities for the widest number of people within the Black and Latino community so we can have self-determination. How important is it, and, and, and be honest with me, uh, how important is, is it for Black and Latino leadership to really pretty much walk the same line? Uh, and, and do you find friction between Black and Latino politicians and getting stuff done? And how important would it be for us to vote together the same way? And, and why does it matter for us to think alike? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's important for us to move together because we have shared interests, shared experiences, and shared aspirations for an America that's colorblind. We're not there yet, but for an America that's colorblind and we're stronger working together. I mean, that's something I was proud of, you know, our boy Ruben Diaz Jr. I got to know him when I was in the assembly. Diaz was in the assembly. He was killing it. And we worked together, Black and Latino legislators in Albany. Here in, in Washington, it's a similar dynamic. You have the Congressional Black Caucus. Then you have the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And then you have the Asian and Pacific Islander Caucus. But there's an umbrella group called the Tri-Caucus. And that's the three of us. And when the tri-caucus speaks, stuff happens. Things move. Ooh. People pay attention. And as long as we continue to do that inside the Capitol and outside, I think we'll be able to make progress for our respective communities. Yeah, we got to do that, man. We, we, we got to think as one, whether we're talking about what's going on. Any community uh, that's... Uh, going through poverty or disenfranchised or, or going through systemic racism or going through poor education or, or health. You know, it's always Latino and black. And somehow, uh, I know this is probably a longer conversation. They split it between us and made it like <laughs> black, Latino, where I've, I've always looked at it as one. When Big Pun made the record body crop, Marty and I, Marty, we always looked at it as one. And I always said the day that we move together, but I mean just move together, it'll be the most powerful day in America. And, and, and that's what I think people fear too as well, is Blacks and Latinos truly united, not, you know, you know, together. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, because I got the great Talib Kweli waiting 
We can Shout out to you, you know Talib, boy. Oh, I need your top five. Favorite rappers of all time. All time. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me say that, I mean, I think the criteria that I've always tried to just informally apply, lyrical skill, right, cultural impact, mm. and longevity. Mm. I mean, you know about longevity. You talk about, you know, flow Joe, what's love, lean back, yeah, you yeah. know, make it rain. Yeah. That's longevity, right? Yes, so it is. When you, when you think about those three factors, I would say Snoop, reverse order, right? Nas, I mean, one of the best lyricists of all time. When I first heard Represent, I was just like, this is crazy. Someone gave me the demo tape, actually, because I knew somebody in Columbia, Columbia Records for the BDP conflict with MC Shan. He said, Dad, I almost crashed the car, right? Nas, I say Jay-Z, of course, legendary. And then, you know, God, God bless, you know, Tupac and Biggie, you know, as, as one and two, Biggie. So you said in reverse Pop. order. So Biggie that's and right. Pop. Oh, that's a strong top five. That's a strong top five. And I respect it in every way. Um, and I can tell Biggie's your favorite. Um, but, uh, Snoop Dogg, man, that, 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 all that music, that chronic, all that music he was putting out. When we heard, people don't know, Snoop Dogg's the world's most famous rapper. But when we heard him, his, his flow was so different than everybody else's. And, uh, and boy, I love Snoop. I love your top five, man. That's a, that's a legit top five. Ruben told me you would have a legit top five. <laughs> you know, AOC came on here. Yeah. And she's picked the usual suspects. And then number five, she said, Karis won. And everybody went crazy, like, oh, like, you wouldn't think she'll pick Karis won. But she's from the Bronx, Cory Booker. He picked his top five and threw Queen Latifah somewhere in there because she's from Newark. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But he threw his, he threw a mean one. Y'all, I thank you so much for coming on here. I appreciate you. I appreciate you as a man. Uh, of having so much courage, you know what I mean? That's what I respect in people the most, a person who wants to give back to the people and help the people, but most of all have courage, you know, for you to go up in there and represent our people and our community in front of the world and even the impeachment trial. Like, I know that must have, that must have been a big, big, big stress on you and your family, but I appreciate you for it, my brother. I appreciate you, man. You know, here in the Capitol, people say you haven't made it until you on Meet the Press. But back at home, we haven't made it until you on the Fat Joe show. So I appreciate what you've done yes! for me and this my boys. This is boy. the biggest show in the game, baby. There you go. There you go. Act like Thank you Thank know. you so much, my brother. Thanks, Joe. All right. Woo! Woo! It's the biggest show in the game. You don't know who I know. You don't know who I know. I need my brother Talib Kwali, where you at? Talib Kwali, where you at? I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your patience. It's the big payback. No Talib, doubt. Thank you, man. Thank you for, you know, me and you, we rap homies. That's you know, right. when you get when you get Hakeem Jeffries on the one and two, and you get to speak with somebody who's for the people, but yet he's in the government. And at a time where we're looking for answers, and our mm -hmm. people need answers from someone we can trust. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to pick his brain and 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 find out what he thinks. Uh and you yourself, man. Uh, lyrically, I'm Tali Kwali. <laughs> right? Right, right, right. Uh, he said, if it's only the skills, Jay said, if it's only the skills, lyrically, I would be Tali Kwali. What do you think he meant by that bar right there? 
Um, first of all, a lot of people don't know that Hove is somebody who studied the, the lyrics of the game. Um, you know, I think that being a businessman, you want to eliminate and minimize risk. And being an artist, you want to take all the risk you could possibly take. People like Hove, people like Nas, even people like yourself have figured out a way to be a businessman and minimize the risk on the business end, but still take the risk as an artist. And I think that's what Jay-Z was ex exploring and explaining. Around that time when Jay-Z said that lyric, he was wearing Che Guevara uh, sweatshirts. He was touring, doing shows with The Roots. He was doing remixes with Dead Prez. He was letting people know, and I think Jay-Z is a secret 5%er, by the way, you know what I'm saying? He was, he was letting people know mm -hmm. that the people I look to for inspiration um, are, the, are the real, real lyricists. And it was a huge compliment to myself and a common from one of the best in the game. And, and I appreciated them flowers when he gave them. Yeah, because he definitely gave me them flowers. And I agree. I think he said, yo, I got, you know, I got to get that paper. You know, Jay-Z's mm -hmm. a capitalist. Yes. You know, yes. So he's like, yo, I got to get that paper. But let me tell you something. If I would be my true self, my natural self, mm -hmm. And wouldn't mm -hmm. think about the paper, lyrically, mm -hmm. I'd be Tali Kweli. Well, it's interesting because now you see Jay-Z with the headbands and the dreads, and he looked like how I used to look in high school. You know what I'm saying? Because I used to rock that same style. So I feel like when Jay-Z became a billionaire, he didn't have to, he, he didn't have a risk no more. He could he he give go a to, fuck no more. Now he's he rapping, he he rapping over be. Nina Simone. Yeah, he's rapping over Nina Simone samples and everything, just, just like me. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. It, it was a huge compliment. And um, I think he tied the game together. I think Kanye before him with the Louis Vuitton backpack.